Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show with special guest, master musician, composer, and music licensing expert, Michael Elsner. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Rich Redman here. This is another episode of The Rich Redman Show, coming to you live from Music City, USA, beautiful Nashville, Tennessee. Of course, I'm here with my trusty sidekick, my co-producer, hey Jim McCarthy, jimmccarthyvoiceovers.com, and I'm so excited to have my guest today, Mr. Michael Elsner. Hey. Michael, don't leave What's me hanging. On, <laughs> We're multitaskers as musicians. He's like, hey, I'm trying to address the camera. Um, this is great because... Because you are, not only you're a friend, but you are a staple of the Nashville and Los Angeles music business. Just like you. You're a guitar player. <laughs> you are a composer. And you have had 2,200 song placements, which makes you an expert on the subject of, okay, I'm going to write a song. It's a bunch of ones and zeros. We create this crazy <laughs> MP3 that some German guy came up with in yeah. a lab. And then that's where people stop. They go, now what? But you actually yeah, know exactly how yeah. to get music placed and how to yeah. monetize it. Well, the goal is to take the time and deposit it into your bank account, right? Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and have other people enjoy your music, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, actually, like, you know, have the time actually mean something that you're, you know, if you're going to put your time into recording your songs. Um yeah, actually get it out there and, and let it work for you on the, on the back end. For sure. So 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 guitar is your it's passion. Your, it's your passion. <laughs> it's your it's your weapon of choice. Sure. And you've been doing this a lot. You're you know you're in your forties like me. Yeah, so, right? forty four. Yeah, and um, <laughs> you're from Woodstock, New Woodstock, York. Woodstock, New York. That's great. I mean, that's great yeah. stock to be from. I mean, yeah, it's a good music community to grow up in. Uh, you know, and um, obviously there's a there's a rich history of music up in that area. So uh, so I was exposed to it at a young age. You know. Um, but uh, the other cool thing about uh, growing up in Woodstock is there's a lot of uh, well-known recording studios there as well. And uh, so from the time I was a teenager, I started hanging out in those studios and um, just, you know, getting uh, comfortable in the studio environment. Uh, not necessarily recording, but just being there and understanding the whole process. And uh, you know, this is long before Pro Tools. This is the mid-90s. So, uh, so, yeah, it was definitely a, a good thing to grow up around and that that intrigued me in in my teen years to you know start learning the production side as well you know and uh, uh i saw these guys who were you know producers controlling the whole whole process of recording songs and of course i was always writing songs in the bands i was in so uh i wanted to learn how to do that as well you know and uh, so that so growing up in woodstock played a large role in that you, you yeah. realize very early on, like, look, at, I need to take the power. And well, you know. Yeah, yeah. It just, just the process of being in control of uh, or just the, having the knowledge and the ability to control the recording process, uh, I thought as a musician uh, was actually more freeing and creatively rewarding, right. you know. Um, and then I had my first experience, you know, in, in the studio with a band that was in back in 2006, I'm sorry, back in 1996. Sure. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we did a record and we actually had a fairly uh, well-known and, and successful engineer producer work on that record for us. Um, we went to him and he, you know, basically became the, the producer of it. And he did an unbelievable job, but when he was done with it, uh, you know, after the novelty wore off, after about, you know, two or three months of listening to it in my car every day, uh, I realized this record sounds nothing like what, the band. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that was um, that was the point where I made a decision that I was never going to let someone else control the recording process. Because these were songs, you know, we spent every weekend playing shows, uh, saving up money, you know, uh, every every penny we made from, from uh, people who came in to see us play, they all went to that recording. And... Um, you know, and, and really after, the, I think after the novelty wore off, I realized this this kind of sucks. What was the, <laughs> what was that band? It was just a just an obscure band back up in upstate New York. We did uh, a couple of little recordings up there yeah. for, through the late nineties. No, you know, we didn't really do anything beyond the the little um, region regional scene. Did you? So, yeah. What were some of the studios up there? That I mean, Bearsville recording studio. Yeah. Bearsville, that's yeah. where like Rush Tot recorded. Tot no, no, no. Uh, that was that was Todd Rundgren's studio. Rush recorded up in Canada. 
Uh, I think they might have. They recorded with Todd Rundgren at one point, I believe. Maybe huh. they did. Well, Todd Rundgren did Meatloaf's "Bad Out of Hell" album. Mm-hmm. There, uh, that was actually um, the history of, of Bearsville well Recording Studio was owned by Albert Grossman, who mm-hmm. was the manager for Bob Dylan, and and uh, so there were a lot of artists back in the '60s and '70s that lived in Woodstock: Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, obviously Bob Dylan, uh, Todd Rundgren, uh, and Todd basically became his his main engineer and, uh, and and producer and then you know Todd did a lot of that stuff the band uh, you know um, they recorded their uh, the the uh, their album uh, songs from Big Pink wow. at a house just right outside Woodstock right down um, down the street and uh, that they became Bob Dylan's band you know so there's a rich history there and then um, so bands like REM recorded at at uh, Bearsville Ozzy Osbourne you know so mm-hmm. there was a it was a big studio do you are you aware of that growing up you you grew up in connecticut yeah but <clears throat> well i you know i started playing you. drums when i was six or seven years old and you know i was listening to kiss and stuff mm-hmm. but the idea of like you know where people gather to make music it was just right. totally foreign to me i wasn't i mean i remember reading about that studio yeah. you know uh for years you know they were reco- I, I know a lot of bands recorded there and did documentaries there and things i, I want to say i think rush might have did an album or two yeah, there. jim's kind of a rush head but i mean even dream theater did an album there i believe he's also kind of a dream theater head dream theater did um dream theater did their album uh what happened to your mic uh, yeah i know it sounds like it just disappeared doesn't yeah. it check one two one did two pop in uh, i didn't do a thing to it that's interesting jim's our engineer but did, uh did it get muted by accident? Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. There we uh, go. My iPad there had it. Go. Sorry. Sorry, Got guys, muted. but see, he's like, it's already troubleshooting. <laughs> saw, saw yeah. Did you mute on. it? <laughs> he's, a, he's like, I saw the really red yeah. light on. Notice I was saying it very nicely, like, did it happen to get muted? But yet the red light is just shining in my face. Yeah. <laughs> see, these are the etiquette things you learn from hanging out in a studio. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. The, the, uh, the bright red light, I understand. Yeah. yeah. Could <clears throat> that have possibly happened? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, uh, what was that? Where was I going with? I was going to say something with Dream was, Theater. So, Dream Theater, they recorded. I don't think they recorded. I'm a huge Dream Theater fan. Right. Also, Rush was my first uh, uh, concert ever. Wow. Actually, the Presto tour. Mine was yes. The oh, Union yeah. tour. Oh, so Union mm-hmm. was an unbelievable record. It I was really was. Just thinking about that record mm-hmm. yesterday because uh, uh, I was thinking of the song um, "Lift Me Up." Yes, that's yeah, a yeah, good yeah. song. It's an unbelievable song. with Bill Bruford up on the electric toms. Yeah. That were up yep. there. What was yeah. your first concert, Rich? Um. Chuck Berry. Really? Really? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And then Maynard Ferguson and then Buddy Rich. Um, My dad took me to all these concerts in El Paso, Texas. And uh, I also got to see Carmine Apice's project, King Cobra. Oh, wow. And the lead singer, from what I understand, is now a woman. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Hey, you know. Yeah, it's crazy. (laughs) There you go. Things you learn. Yeah. Um, it but, was it was funny because I mean Michael sat down and instantly we you know we we had a rapport with being from the same part of the country and we started talking about he's like oh my gosh it was the the East, East Coast, Coast Music Mall. Mall and I'm going oh my you know, floods of memories just came <laughs> back to me and I'm going someone actually knows the East Coast Music Mall oh yeah you know in Danbury yeah. Connecticut yeah. when I, I knew existed. exactly how to get there yep yeah Hayes Town Road Danbury yeah yeah yeah. So drive drive down the thruway to Newburgh and then take a you know what was it eighty four 84. 84? yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that was playing in bands was your college education or did you go to college uh, I, I I wasted a lot of time in college I, I can't say I went to college I was I was shipped off to college what was this what was this yeah what, what's cool it was uh, uh well I, I dropped out and I quit a number of times so I went to a lot of different colleges oh wow <laughs> yeah, we it never, was the we worst thing ever that. I hated it. College was awful. So um, I didn't want to go to college. I wanted to go to music school. I was, was never able to. So I ended up uh, at a bunch of student, uh, SUNY schools, which are State University of New York schools. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, and supposedly, you know, I was supposed to go, but I didn't. I just sat in my dorm and played guitar and, and failed. Wow. <laughs> so it's That's okay. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I attended, you know, I was there, but I didn't ever go to class or anything like wow. that. Wow. Yeah, yeah, it was just awful. I hated it. The reason why I'm intrigued by your area is because it's the same area I grew up in and played music in and was in bands around that area. Yeah. Were you familiar with like a band named Jam Syndicate? Jam Syndicate, I know of. Okay. Yeah. Rob Jackson, Never who saw worked them. at East Coast Music okay. Mall, was a yeah, singer yeah, yeah. for that band. Yeah. A lot of talent up in that area. Yeah. Like the, the the bass player for that band was just phenomenal. There was, there was a regional music magazine that I can't think of right now. More Sugar. <laughs> no, that... I, 
Was that what it was? It was, I, like, it was like, you know, they basically featured all the um, cover bands and whoever was in the music industry in that area. Sure. So this is More a, Sugar Entertainment. This is uh, it's kind of funny, but I used to go get my hair cut at a... Uh, I used to have super long hair. I was thinking I mean, that you were just... Stupid long hair. You know? In your dorm, just growing <laughs> Oh, hair. yeah. I mean, like down to my waist hair, you know. And, uh, and I used to go to this place... Um, to get it cut called locks that rock oh my, <laughs> oh my <gosh>. god <laughs> and uh because it was like the place that cut like all the local musicians hair right <laughs> but they had like every every time that i went there they had that magazine that local magazine with all the all the bands and stuff like that so that's right. how I, I knew of jam syndicate and uh um and then you know eventually you know uh we, we got in there a couple times with, with the band i was in uh which was really the band i was in during college which is why i stayed there during those college years because i was um playing in a band for uh, i guess about four years you probably yeah. know lou calderola then does that ring a bell no the I drummer no no yeah. i mean rich no. you, you know lou. yeah i met yeah. lou yeah but he was with uh, he was with a bunch of bands in that area as well. So you know what's interesting is during that time um, in in my life, I was so quiet and shy that I just really never went out and socialized with with other players. I would sit and and I'd sit and you know obviously practice guitar and write songs. And at that point, I had a four track and eventually went up to an eight track. So I spent so much time uh, just writing music and then doing the productions. And all the other guys in my band were always out socializing and meeting the other bands and stuff like that. And I just didn't uh, I just didn't have the um, uh, the outgoing personality at that point yet in my life to mm -hmm. go out and meet a lot of. But players. you do now. Yeah, but you happened. still hermit a little bit because you have that. You're a mad scientist, <laughs> and you're in the studio just being a mad scientist. Then I'll then I'll get a text from you like, Moscow Mule. Yeah, let's get a need Moscow a mule. Moscow <laughs> Mule. And when he says need a Moscow Mule, he means that over the course of four or five hours, he will only drink one Moscow yeah. Mule. <laughs> Meanwhile, I end up feeling really bad about myself. <laughs> okay. So well, well, I walked in and first thing yeah. he said to me was like, "Was like, oh, you've, you've seen the place, right?" I'm like, "No, I've just dropped you off here a couple times." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the kindness of, of my friends. Yeah. When did you move here to Nashville? Uh, I've moved here twice. Okay, first so I mo time. I moved here first time in 1998. Okay. okay. Uh, then I left uh, after a couple of years. And I went to Los Angeles, and I moved here again at the very end of 2011. Although I, I don't really count that because I literally got into town. Uh, moved my stuff into an apartment and then went back to New York for the holidays. So mm. I really basically got back into town in the beginning of 2012. Um, so yeah, this is the second time living here. So so you basically came down here. Uh, were you familiar with uh, the home of rock and roll, I-95? 95.1. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Jim has a background in an, radio. Oh, okay. I, I worked there. That was my first radio station. I cut oh, cool. my teeth there doing voiceover and production okay. and on-air stuff. I was known as Fat Gilly on the air. That was also my band name. <laughs> Fat my, Gilly? Fat Gilly. Why Gilly? Okay, here's the story. I was in a band called Connecticut White Bread. Yeah. Does that ring a bell? No. Thank God it doesn't. Um, actually, the music wasn't bad. The lyrics were just completely deplorable. Sure. Yeah. You know, very un unpolitically sure. Correct, sure. Uh, incorrect. And um, th for the longest time, the guitar player who the band was his brainchild knew my last name but decided to call me McGillicuddy. Okay. So that became Magilla. Yeah. McGill and it became Gilly. Got it. And they're like, hey fatty and they used to sing Fat Gilly along with Top Jimmy. Oh yeah. Fat Gilly that. Yeah. looks yeah. So that's how yeah. yeah, that was my honor. Nicknames <laughs> are a wonderful thing. You really can't fabricate it. They just have to happen organically. Yeah. yeah. Like everybody calls you Richie. It's I've never so, called you Richie. It's so funny. Yeah. Some people just gravitate towards I'm Rich or I'm Redmond or I'm Richie or I'm the Redmond. I have the like Redmond. Groove yeah, yeah, Boy. Yeah, yeah. How did yeah. Groove Boy come about? Um, there was a, there was a girl and yeah that, that gave me that nickname and it was during the AOL period and she's like, "You're Groove Boy." And then I got Groove Boy at AOL.com. AOL Messenger. I was getting into chat rooms. <laughs> <laughs> I was so happy I got Groove Boy, and it wasn't like Groove Boy One, Groove, Groove Boy, Boy Ninety Two. Yeah. It wasn't Groove Boy One, Two, Three, Four. <laughs> it was Groove Boy, and so like even my LinkedIn account now is Rich Groove Boy Redman, which isn't very professional, uh, but I'll have to. But check. hey, you know it, it harkens back to your history. Totally. <laughs> and we all. So let's talk about the. You know I. I you know, I think that talking about your time in, in Los Angeles, because, you know, we both love Los Angeles yeah. and the culture of Los Angeles yeah, and awesome. all the, the fun things that that playground of a city offers <laughs> a, uh, yeah. 
a d- man children like us. I love it. It was, <laughs> you know? it was, it was, it was uh, definitely the best, best years of my life by far. Yeah. And so what period was that? Was, uh, uh, that was 28 to 36. As that was the night for age wise, but as far as time wise, that was 2003 to 2000, very into 2011. That's nice. And, 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 you know, I was looking at your website, Mike Elsner.com, Michael, right? Michael, Michael yeah. Elsner.com. Yeah. Hi, you're Mike to me. Yeah, I know. Um, Richie. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> it's, boy. it's a very, it's very, um, it's just a lot of stuff on there. And I'm looking at some of the video, uh-huh. one of which is Drew Carey introducing you playing <laughs> on the price is right. <laughs> and you were like, he's like modeling a guitar. And and then Drew Carey's like that's Michael Elsner everyone Michael Elsner just shredding I on just the kept playing and then you were on you were on some Telemundo gig and then yeah. and then you work with folks in China I mean your playing yeah. diet is you know you're a genre bender I mean you're you're a shredder I know you can yeah. shred but you've also played and produced with country acts and pop acts and and then the movie Juno, that award-winning indie film, anything that's on that soundtrack. Or, I've worked with the, with the guy, who, Matt Messina. Yeah. Actually, Matt Messina is the guy who uh, is a composer. He did Juno, and uh, and he um, he's done a lot of a lot of shows. In fact, right as I was walking up the stairs, I saw the latest post. He has a new new film out uh, on his on his Facebook page. And um, Matt's been great. I met Matt when I first moved to Los Angeles, and uh, and I. I started working with him in 2007 mm-hmm. and it was the summer of 2007 and he actually called me um, and uh, it was just this little independent film and, and I went over and, and played it at his uh, studio and I think we spent two days recording or one day recording and went back and made some fixes and then they went back later and, and you know changed some other things and, uh, and that was really the start of my relationship working with him and that film, my very first the time working with him was Juno. Uh, that came out at the end of that year. But then um, I think the, the the next thing that I did with him was actually a TV show that he got. And then I've just been working with him for many years. And, and uh, you know, it's interesting because when I left Los Angeles, I think within, within like six months of me leaving Los Angeles, he moved up to Seattle, which is where he's originally from. And this is kind of getting off topic, but what's interesting about this is that, you know, he still works on all these big films and all these big shows. And, and I live here now, but all of my work for the most part is in Los Angeles. And what's amazing is uh, just the way that technology has allowed us compared to what it was back in the mid nineties when I first started hanging out in studios and learning the, the technology of recording. Now, literally you can just record uh, and, and, and work from anywhere. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't have to live in Los Angeles, although I loved it. You don't have to live there to be able to work out of there. And, and more and more musicians uh, that I worked with during my time there are no longer living there. You know, a lot of them have moved, to, you know, they got married and they had families and they want to have a, you know, different lifestyle, but they still work out of Los Angeles. Which right. is it's just, just amazing. It's just awesome. Yeah, so you yeah. can be, you can be here have a, a bigger house and cheaper house and yeah and, and slower paced lifestyle right. or not spend so much time sitting in your car in traffic. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. You know. Um, but yeah, it, it was it was really uh, interesting, you know, when I moved to Los Angeles in 2003, um, uh, I I was there just a couple months and I and I got a gig on a TV show. Uh, which wasn't really what I was moving there for, um, but I just I wanted to start connecting with with people, and uh, and uh, I ended up, you know, kind of getting into that world. Um, and I think by the end of by the end of two thousand and three, within the first six months of living there, I'd already played on on my first film, and my first film I ever did was uh, uh, Ella Enchanted with with Anne Hathaway. Nice. Um, so it kind of started there, and then I just started working with composers. Uh, you know, playing guitar on, on their shows. And I started learning the difference between uh, playing on a TV show or a film um, compared to playing on a record. And the difference really is the speed of things. You know, when you're working on a record, um, you know, you have a lot of time. Everything has to be perfect from a guitar player's standpoint. You know, every strum has to be perfect. And it really is a, a perfect recording, you know, and you, you take the time to, to get that. Yeah. Uh, and when I started working with composers, I you know, they, they were working on so many cues in a day. You know, we'd, we'd do, you know, 13 or 14 cues in a day. But literally from start to finish, he would write them. Then you'd play them. His engineer would record them and mix them. And then he'd be moving on to the next cue. And a cue is just a, a snippet of music for a particular scene. So basically you can say like, you know, scenes. Mm-hmm. Um, and and really, you know, you didn't have a lot of time to... to um, go back and fix things. It didn't mean you made a lot of mistakes, but it was almost even more high pressure where you got to get it right in the first 
you know, yeah. two two takes, You're maybe three fast. takes. You're working very fast. Yeah, and, and there's and from what I understand, talking to guys like yourself and other composers that have, uh, you know, big shows, is there's insane deadlines. Oh yeah, the deadlines are are very real. Uh, you know, a lot of times if you're working on an album, they want to have the record done by, you know, say it's August 1st, they want to have the record done by, you know, October 1st. But that can always move a little bit. Yeah. In the TV world, that episode is coming out on this day. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, like they it's, have it's already sync- scheduled. It's it's on Tuesday at yeah. 8 o'clock. <laughs> yes. So, uh, so that music has to be done, you know, by this time because that's when the mixer, the re-recording mixer is mixing everything. And uh, yeah, so the deadlines are extremely extremely real and and very quick mm. yeah very quick turnaround what was the one project you had that was kind of like man this is I'm, I'm actually doing it this is like a big break and i can't believe i get to do what i do so i uh interesting um when it comes to writing i ended up getting a gig writing for american idol in 2010 so i did 2010 2011 i wrote for it and that was seasons 11 and 12 mm-hmm. um I think that was the one where I thought, wow, this is like, I'm, that was a lot of work. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, but that led to a lot of other things as well. But that, that, was, um, that was probably the time where I thought, wow, I, this is, I mean, this is, this is real. That's you when know? you were writing cues, right? But well, I was, I, I think I was I writing remember. tension beds for, tension for the beds. first season. And the second season, I started writing more of the vocal background. So for the folks, beds. yeah, the folks that don't know out there, describe like, what a tension bed is and it's when you're going like it's yeah it's uh it's uh i always kind of joke about it in one sense because there's a scene in in uh, in a movie called forgetting sarah marshall Mm -hmm. where the guy's like you know he's making a joke about it he just hits a note you know and it's just like this droning thing sometimes it can be like that but but tension beds did you do that sarah marshall no, I didn't. No, I didn't. But but I just thought the way he he t- discussed them always uh, kind of resonated with me a little bit. <laughs> but um, tension beds are the, the, those awkward moments where the contestant stands in front of the judges and it looks at the, the, the mm-hmm. camera faces the the contestant and they stand there for like you know ten seconds of silence and it goes back to the judges and they're looking at each other <laughs> and it's silent and it's yeah they're all making this, they're making faces like yeah it's just stuff that you know really didn't happen live right. Like, you know. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> we need some B-roll. I, I've been of to you. some of those tapings for yeah. some of the shows that I've worked on. It's really fun <laughs> to see what really happened versus the way they presented. Yes. Mm-hmm. But um, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, but it's it's that stuff which is basically like like a drone note and lots of taiko drums going. <laughs> Yeah, the little Japanese men in diapers playing <laughs> taiko drums. <laughs> yeah, so For, so that's. But, but the funny thing is, is that there's a lot of trends that go with those sounds. Oh, yeah. Like the you know the big gong the the. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, that's a, a of, that's a thing. A lot of sound design. Or lot the, of, lot of, yeah. Those are for all the Michael Bay yeah. movies. So those are the sub yeah. drops. There's actually yeah. terms for these. Yeah. Sub drops. The sub, yeah, sub. See, as a radio guy, <laughs> I would rip those off the actual trailers and go, "I'm going to use that in a yeah. piece of imaging or something." So we ended up, uh, my partner and I, my writing partner and I, we ended up doing a whole album of called Impact, which is all those types of things like sub drops, risers, all that. And I, I'd be it, very curious to, to look into buying that. It's from you. unbelievable how oh, many he's placements got we got. We got. Yeah. Just on he's got doom. fire and ice. He's <laughs> got <laughs> stuff. Here. Well, I mean, in the <laughs> Avengers Endgame movie, I'm a huge yeah. Avengers fan. And on the soundtrack, when, I don't know if you guys saw the movie. Did you see the movie? I saw half of, of Endgame on the plane. Okay. Did you see Endgame? I did not know. Okay. Well, there's a part of the movie where, you know, the crescendo of the movie starts happening. Uh-huh. And that's where all of a sudden, you know, the, he's standing on the war zone by himself against Thanos' army. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden you hear, yeah. you know, the big... Yeah. Asian drum, yeah, yeah, what yeah, they yeah, call yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. green like screens, big, big taiko drum oh that, that you can tune down. Yeah, <laughs> just a yeah, yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, there's going to be a lot of yeah. single ladies that are going to be yeah. rubbing up against their computer. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, but you know, look at some of these writing credits, guys. I mean, check this out. You got um, the Voice, Cold Case, Ellen. High school musical. Kind of, I mean, this is great. It's extra. Musical. What kind of tension beds did you have to do for Ellen? Oh no, 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 no. Those are actual <laughs> real songs. The the uh, the American Idol first season only was the tension beds. Gotcha. Um, gotcha. I hated doing those. Uh, <laughs> so you're saying a song? So <laughs> I hated this could them, be man. a three and a half minute say um, modern pop song with or without vocals. Oh, they're all they're all full full songs. Every, and then Ellen might have it when she's going to commercial. Sure. Or or yeah, exactly. Or is or, she? Or, or, or background music? Maybe when someone's walking on on. On okay. she introduces someone, uh, you know. There's, 
really, you know, one of the things I tell people who are interested in licensing, I, I say, you know, for the next week or so, because one of the questions that always comes up is, you know, like, you know, uh, I write country music, you know, can I get my songs placed? Well, all you have to do is spend the next week, stop watching TV, just lay there and listen to it. Um, when you, in, in, in any channel, you know, just mm -hmm. go to any channel and when it gets to a commercial, stay there through the commercial, don't get up, you know, because you'll realize that literally from the time you lay, you 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 hit you know you turn the TV on uh, to when you turn it off. Music is nonstop underneath virtually every show and every commercial. Mm -hmm. It's nonstop. Uh, in fact, it's it's all oftentimes it's it's that pulse that keeps the 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 momentum going. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you do this, you you realize that it's it's like listening to a radio station. Oftentimes, like in another country, you know, you go to another country, you listen to radio there, and it's all these different genres of music. It's not like in America where it's like just pop, just, you know, 90s yeah. pop or whatever. Interesting. It's like you can go to another country and listen to like Iron Maiden followed by, you know, Tiffany followed by Adele. <laughs> Yeah. Playing what we want. I love that. <laughs> that would be. Yeah. That's called Jack FM. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, so it's kind of TV's kind of like that, and you, you know, you can hear something from like 1920s jazz to you know 1970s Kiss uh, to you know modern stuff to even futuristic you know stuff because you know shows take place in in all years and all different styles and the, all that. Yeah. The funny thing is that the stuff you're talking about is that not everybody understands that goes on. That there's somebody behind. Those little, like, you know, you watch Friends and it transitions to a different scene in here. Yeah. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's a, it sets up the whole new Someone scene. Someone had to make that. Someone had to make that. Yeah. That was probably that was the one same of the... thing for me in radio when yeah. I first started doing imaging work and hearing, uh, you never attributed there was an actual person yeah. behind the guy who said, you know, I-95. Yeah. You know, and it, it was like the big imaging voice. Yeah. And then I started working for a radio station. I'm going, oh, that's an actual person. It's not somebody yeah. that walks around yeah. actually sounding like this all yes. the time. Yeah, yeah. Because you would hear the outtakes. I don't know, Jim. You sound the, like that a lot. <laughs> in the in the sessions, yeah. you'd hear him be like, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and take another take of that. You know, all of a sudden they sounded human. Yeah. They didn't sound like a god anymore, yeah. you know? Yeah. It was just so weird. It, yeah. it, it was, for me, it was really just surreal, I guess, yeah. you know? Well, you know, <clears throat> like when I got out to California and I started working in the TV industry, it was, it was very interesting because it was such a drastic difference yeah, and a new experience than what I was used to in the music industry, even though the process of creating the music was exactly the same. Yeah. It was just a different outlet and kind of like, you know, uh, what you're saying, you know, when you're in the studio and you're seeing how things really go down, it's like, oh, wow, this is like, this is the same approach. Yeah. They're, they're all doing, but you don't really realize that these people really existed to, <laughs> to do this type of work. You There's know? a human behind yeah, this. Yeah, because a lot of times, like at least in, in the TV thing, you know, people don't really listen to the music so much. They're focused on, it's mm -hmm. more subliminal. It's happening in the background and, and it's it's dramatically affecting the overall vibe and the feel and the mood and the emotion of the scene. But you're, <laughs> you're, real, you're paying attention to the dialogue in the story. So you're not listening to like that music in the background. You know, yeah. you know, you know it comes to mind. And I started laughing when I thought about this. You ever see the end of Star Wars without the music? <laughs> <laughs> the, first episode, the first Star that, Wars that movie. That would be amazing. What I never it? have. but It's where they're all walking up they and they're getting They get, their, getting, oh, they get yes. their medals. I have seen that. And it's somebody took the music yeah, out. Yeah. And then you hear like coughing in, in the background. <laughs> and it's the most yeah. awkward scene to watch. It's so yeah. awkward. Because you hear yeah. coughing? Oh, no. Well, it's just that they're walking up and all the scenes are them just looking at each other like. Yeah. And then, you know, they're looking back at each other, just nodding at each other. And like, it's silent. Looking. It's silent. Yeah. It's so Except for like awkward. someone dropping something in the, in, with the big reverb. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. I'm going to go look it up. Oh, my it's God. A, it yeah. is so just. It's just so important to, to have music as part of the emotional content. <laughs> it really and is. as someone, you know, in recent years, you know, four years yeah, yeah. of studying acting, you know, watching actors, you know, I focus on watching, really watching the scenes yeah. and how in it are they and how connected are they yeah. and wonder how many times they had to take that and yeah. how many cover angles they covered yeah. to get the scene. And for somebody like you who's been matching music to actor scenes, you're probably really tuned in because you've seen all sorts of raw footage. You, you know, it's really funny. The funniest uh, footage that I've uh, kind of <laughs> going off of what you've, you've done is I have friends who are editors, who are uh, dialogue editors. And, sure. Um, and uh, like they work on like cartoons and stuff, mm -hmm. you know, family, you know, kids shows and stuff. 
and and they'll <laughs> they'll just get bored and they'll just take a normal sentence and cut out a word and put a beep beep in there. <laughs> <laughs> and it can be like something as simple as like like we'll just sit down on the bench yeah. you know and we'll have a good time and it's like we'll just sit down on beep and we'll have a good time and, it's, it's, and so you know you start insinuating all these yeah <laughs> And those are those are the those are really funny. But you know what's interesting is is um, having sp- <laughs> having spent some time with some uh, some editors, just seeing how they can choose a different piece of music for a scene, how just the music changes. You know, I've been in I've been in uh, some uh, some uh, big you know uh, uh, studios you know on on set where uh, or on like on like the actual like you know like Warner Brothers uh, yeah. you know lots and stuff like that or whatever where. Where they're recording, you know, um, orchestra, and it's the same exact scene, and they'll do two or three different pieces, and I've and I've watched how the two, like, okay, the first one that's okay, the second one that's that's fine, and then the third one, it's the same scene, it's just the music is dramatically different that it it almost makes you cry, mm-hmm. because the the music is so emotional with that scene, but yet the other two, eh, eh, they were okay, they didn't do anything, but that third one just brought out this emotion. You're like, yeah. holy crap, this yeah. is amazing. It was just just it makes you think about music supervisors and how. <clears throat> it's a female job. A lot of females in music supervision, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's. I, I think that it's female dominate. Well, yes. There's, in my experience, there's been more females, but there are definitely males in that field for sure. Same with casting directors. Ninety percent females. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. I've never auditioned for a movie. So. <laughs> <laughs> but you've watched all this raw footage, which is I'm jealous that you get all those raw files, and then you have to match the stuff. Uh, sometimes, yeah. When you're composing specifically to it, it it's. Uh, it, it's a bit different when you're composing to it as opposed to uh, when, say, a music supervisor is just searching for your song for a specific placement. So there's really two paths. You know, you can go the route of composing for a scene or composing for a trailer or composing for something where you are matching the video. And I've done that. Um, and that is, I mean, that is an art unto itself because so many things aside from just writing the music go into it uh, it starts by timing it out like okay mm-hmm. at 14 seconds there's this thing that happens that i have to hit so what bpm do i have to create this piece at mm-hmm. so that i'm actually hitting it on so there's time? some math there oh absolutely as opposed to just out of the nowhere out of nowhere you just you know hit yeah. something that's off time to you can't do that so it starts with kind of yeah you got to you got to break out the math and figure out okay i need to do this at like 100 you know 34.7 bpm in <laughs> order that, to get your for mark. that to hit at like bar 13 yeah. exactly. you know exactly to hit, to, hit, to hit the post as we say in radio yeah 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 you know it's funny as a producer in radio producing a lot of commercials uh, a lot of my job was picking the music to go along with the dialogue of the script. Oh, sure. And you get so, I mean, I would actually do Facebook live videos of myself. Um, I, I'd finish the, the voiceover for a commercial and the client requested a new bed. So I'd say, mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, guys, you're going to help me pick a bed today. And I would go through all the different beds I have. And I know just within the first two or three seconds yeah. if it's going to, nah, no, yeah. nope, yeah. nope, you know, yeah. and they'd actually be commenting going, that one wasn't so bad. Yeah. No, go with that one. Try yeah. that one. You know, it was just very, just, yeah, I just, I just had fun with it. Yeah. And uh, people got to partake on my You've process. always used Facebook Live in very creative ways. I like yeah, that. Yeah, you know, it was fun. You, you actually get some, some, you know, people just watching you work. Yeah. You know, and, and <laughs> listening. And I'm like, what do you guys think about that? And someone would pop up and be like, I don't like it. Neither do I. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So, so there's got to be a science to creating music for trailers. And this right. is kind of like what yeah. your company does, Sonic <laughs> Tremors. Sonic Trimmer, yeah, uh, yeah. We started that back in 2011. Who's your partner? David Das, uh, another former Nashvilleian who lives out in Los Angeles now. David uh, Das. Yeah, I met him back in the early 2000s when I was living here, and then I think he moved out to LA two years after I did, um, and he's still out in Burbank. And um, so, yes, yeah, so I've been working with David for for quite a long time, and we started doing trailers. Actually, the trailers came about because actually f- because of the American Idol gig. Um, I brought David in to to work on American Idol with me to help orchestrate some of the stuff that I was doing, and uh, then we worked on that show for two years, uh, creating music for it and 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 whatnot, and um, and then we uh, knew of an individual who uh, just released an album for trailers, and he was having this unbelievable amount of success with it. And, uh, and this music that he had released was the pretty much the exact same stuff that we were doing for American mm-hmm. Idol, and he had like I don't know ten or twelve songs, and he was just you know making six figures and killing it. Right. And uh, and we were like, man, we're killing ourselves writing so much music for this show, you know. And uh, and so 
uh, in the summer of 2011, I remember, you know, we were sitting in the studio and I said, man, we need to, we need to get into the trailer world because if he's having this amount of success with, with his tracks and his tracks are not much different than the tracks that we're already writing, but we're focused here, uh, let's, let's pull that out and let's focus here for a little bit. And mm -hmm. so we started Sonic Trimmer. Uh, we did our first album called Dark Light, started it in the summer 2011, and finished it, I think, in like literally right when I moved here, like a, like a week or two before I moved here. And I think when I was driving cross country, it was in mastering. <laughs> mm -hmm. So by the time I got here, we had the, the final versions all, all ready to go. And then, um, yeah, and then we started, you know, pitching that to uh, trailer houses at the beginning of 2008, uh, 2012. I'd fly back to L.A., every you know three months or so three and a half every you know around that three to four month period and um we'd meet with trailer houses and present our music and um you know started getting trailers um out of that and then in 2013 we did another record and then signed with a publishing company to represent the sonic trimmer catalog by that point we'd gotten all the tension beds that we had done for Amer american idol we got that back and we released that as an album called tensity and uh, yeah so over the next uh you know couple years we built sonic trimmer up uh specifically writing music for trailers and film trailers and that's uh all custom that's been good all custom yeah yeah we had a super bowl uh commercial last year it was pretty cool so we kind of hit the pinnacle as far as commercials go that's yeah. incredible <laughs> yeah congratulations yeah, a fun. super bowl awesome. commercial yeah and so every year at the end of the year you get a statement about all your your placements every it's just every well every quarter we do oh, yeah. from our pro's you know that's ascap bmi or csac we're both with you know bmi um and uh, and then every through our publisher every six months we get uh, the itemized list uh, with all the um, you know we get the upfront fees that were owed plus the list of you know where they're coming from and so where they were placed. So the nice thing is that working with a company that represents the catalog, you know, the, all that work is now off of our hands and we're free to just you know stay in creative mode and not have to worry about the administrative side of things. Yeah, so you have a body of work that's working on your behalf to create revenue for you yeah every day yeah that's Amazing. what they call mailbox money kids yeah, yeah. so it's so you're <laughs> passive income this portion <laughs> of the music industry which is so hard to you crack. know to 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 get into is it truly is passive income and then that led to you to want to share and educate people on that well see the thing is i actually uh i always think it's interesting when people think that that licensing is a difficult industry to get into because it's actually the easiest thing to get into uh, uh, believe me, it is the easiest thing to get into if you know what you're doing. Okay. I, I think, I think, and it starts by by just being clear about this. Is you know, when it comes to the, the licensing world, I always make sure that I, I, I tell people that I, I'm not working in the music industry with licensing. With licensing, your end users have nothing to do with the music industry. Okay, they're not record labels. They're not publishers. Uh, you know, you're not sending your music out to fans. You can. You know, you can do an artist pursuit, but if you're selling your record to fans, that's the music industry path. That's a slightly different path than the licensing route. And basically, in the music industry, there's there's two steps to the process. Step one is you finish your music. Step two is you send it out to your audience, whether that be your, you know, a radio promoter, a, um, a publisher, a manager, a record label, a fan. Okay, it's two steps. The licensing is a little different. You're working in the in the TV industry or the film industry or the video game industry. So your end users are going to absorb your music completely different. And you have to understand that your end users are generally going to be your music editors, your music supervisors, if you're working with a music library, individuals at a music library. Uh, so the process is actually a four-step process to get your music uh, ready for them so that they can easily search, audition, and then license your songs. Mm -hmm. So it's a different process. Uh, once you apply that process i mean really I've, I've pursued you know the music industry for a long time as, as a musician as a songwriter as a guitar player uh the licensing world is is just the easiest thing to get into hmm. if you approach it with a value-oriented mindset right you know you're serving your end users with with quality music um in a way that they can absorb it easily and use it uh, at the same time when they do that they bring value back to you Right. Unfortunately, a lot of musicians approach it wrong and they say, here's my CD. You're say, let's say you're a music supervisor. They're going to hand you a CD and go, here's my CD. Okay. What, what, what value do you, does that give you at all? You, there's no value in that because it's kind of like saying like, hey, Rich, take me out for steak. 
buy me some food. Okay. It's kind of the same thing. It's like, hey, listen, here's my song. Use it. Uh, use my music and pay me money. As opposed to going, if you're working on a show and I can say, hey, Rich, what, what kind of uh, music are you looking for right now on your show? Oh, you know, uh, something that's, uh, you know, not too heavy, almost like adult contemporary. Okay, so so I actually have, here's uh, here's four AC tracks that I have for you, and I've got all the metadata uh, embedded in the audio files. I also have multiple versions and stems, so your engineer, you know, if he if he needs to make any adjustments to, to some levels, he can take the so stem ready mixes to go. and change it. I have some alternate mixes. I also have a 16, 30, and 60 second version. Which yeah, you know very what familiar with that. So, so now, uh, this, this whole process now is very value added mm -hmm. I'm giving you exactly what you need and i'm giving it to you so that your guy has exactly what he needs you're basically saying i'm making your job easier your job is extremely yeah. easy when you work with me yeah. which is what we want to do in any field in any line of work yeah you're correct but unfortunately most musicians don't do that right what is your quote about the uh, narcissism yeah be a service not a narcissist be <laughs> <laughs> that's not hard be a service not a narcissist yeah because i think i think in my experience you know um uh, a lot of musicians approach licensing they go oh i just want to get my songs placed because i need money that's that's the 100 the wrong attitude to have right right now you will you will earn a lot of money right mm -hmm. in the process if you do it correctly but but just by the very nature of having that mindset of i need to do this so i can make money it's it's all about you. It's all about your your money that's coming to you, and so that added, that that mindset subliminally is going to dictate the way that you approach your end users. And if you change that mindset to how can I serve them and how can I you know like you said like how can how can how can I make <coughs> working with me very easy and yeah. as a a good word that I like to use is bulletproof. Right. Uh, in in order to do that, it has to be a, from a service mentality. I, you have a project, you have a goal and a vision for your show that, that you want to get out there, okay? So my goal is to help you realize your goal, right? I'm, I'm going to serve you, and the way that I can serve you is you're looking specifically for adult contemporary songs. I have four of them in my catalog. I'm going to deliver them to you in a way so that you can easily just pull them into your, your, your platform. Let's say you're just using iTunes. You can pull those songs into your iTunes, and if in... Uh, two weeks from now, you're looking for a song in the style of a particular artist, or you know, you can use a bunch of different keywords to describe the track that you need. You can go into your search menu, you can type in those keywords, and if my song um, uh, fits that description, because I've added those keywords to the metadata, it will show up at the bottom of a funnel. So if you have 10,000 songs in your iTunes and you're searching for the perfect song for this particular usage, you're going to type in keywords. My goal is to get to the bottom of that funnel from 10,000 down to maybe like four or five. And then you'll do some quick spot checks, kind of like what you were talking about earlier. You just mm -hmm. spot check, you know, within a couple yeah. minutes, a um, couple seconds. Um, and if one of those works, then you're going to use it. Now, the goal always is to get to the bottom of the how, funnel. How do you get to yeah. the bottom of the funnel? With great metadata. Okay, now tell us about metadata. Well, metadata is just simply the information that you attach to the audio file that describes it. And uh, we're all familiar with metadata in a very basic sense. So going back to the iTunes example, let's say that, that you open up your iTunes and you're really in the mood to listen to Comfortably Numb by Pink Floyd. And let's again, let's say you have 10,000 songs in your iTunes. Uh, you have two options. Your first option is to scroll all the way down to P and then to find Pink Floyd. And then they go, oh, what album? Well, we all know that, that that song is on the wall. But maybe if it's a more obscure song, it might be more difficult. But okay, it's on the wall. So you scroll into the wall. Oh, was it, was it you know, uh, um, disc one or two? Because it's a two disc, uh, you know, album. Oh, I think it was disc one. So there's a process to get to, to Comfortably Numb, which, you know, if you have 10,000 songs in your catalog, it's going to take you a while. Now, the thing is, you you, you know what you're looking for, though, right? Um or the other option that you can do is you can just go up to the search bar and type in comfortably. And all of a sudden, that's going to pop up. That's metadata. Mm -hmm. uh, that that com The word comfortably is embedded as the title of the song. So when you look at your iTunes, it says comfortably numb, Pink Floyd, The Wall. You know, uh, If you type in any of those words, that, those, that song is going to pop up in that search. Uh, so that's metadata in its most basic sense, basic form. Uh, so we're all already familiar with that. But when it comes to licensing, uh, oftentimes editors, music editors, music supervisors, they don't know specifically, I'm looking for a song by Michael Elsner called Delve to the Deep. You know, they don't know that. You know, <laughs> They've got hundreds of thousands of songs. They know that it sounds I like... I don't even guess. know what that song sounds like. And I know it's somewhere in my catalog. I, I know what it sounds like now. But One of the biggest challenges I have yeah. as a producer for different clients of mine, some of them being in the automotive industry, 
uh, car dealerships in, in particular, sure. is finding the beds that fit the dealership, which yeah. are typically high energy, yeah. you know, I don't know. Sometimes I just don't know how to describe it, but you know, a lot of these types of services give you genres and yeah. moods yeah, to, to exactly. choose from. You, so, so you hit the nail on the head. That's what metadata is. Yeah. It's, it's a genre and the mood. So, for example, I, I, being a guitar player, uh, and I've done a lot of heavy shred guitar stuff too, mm-hmm. um, and I love you know heavy rock stuff. So, I have a bunch of albums that would I kind of call it like the military metal genre. <laughs> Uh, and, and by military, by, metal? Yeah, <laughs> military meaning metal. like you know like like those shows that are all about like you know like you know snipers <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know that kind of stuff but that's the same kind of stuff that I'm you hear on like car shows yeah you know like when they're building engines and <clears throat> redoing cars and stuff like american that. chopper Sh- exactly yeah. yeah out of newburgh new york that's right and um <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah orange county choppers uh the um uh what you can do is you just add metadata to into the audio file that describes that track. And so for something like that, you could type in motorcycle, engines, heavy, uh, you know, rocking, you know, various yeah. terms that that, yeah. that people would be looking for, yeah. you know, a muscle car. You know, what like sounds that. good under a disclaimer? That kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, other financial yeah. fast-talking right. disclaimer. Yeah, so so, so if, if someone were to deliver an album with tracks that would be perfect for you, but they added the metadata, when you're searching those moods and those keywords that you were talking about, they're going to get down to the bottom of that funnel. That's and a big. That, that's what how you can quickly big problem solver. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Saves so, time. So that's why licensing is actually very easy because um, we can get into the the stats on it. But but what's crazy is that um, the TV industry is just exploding. Uh, in the last ten years, the number of scripted television shows, which this matters to you, oh, being, yes. being the acting side, uh, has increased one hundred and seventy six percent. It's amazing. Okay. So when you look at the last uh, 10 years in the music industry, well, I know the last 20 years in the, in the industry, like 20 years ago in, in 1999, there was a 969 million physical albums sold. And last year there were 60 million. Wow. So we're down uh, over 90% mm-hmm. drop, right? But then, but then what's interesting is just in the last year alone, uh, physical album sales are down 23%. Uh, uh, what is it? Uh, digital sales of albums are down twenty five percent, and digital sales of of, uh, of singles is down twenty eight percent. So everyone focuses on streaming. No, oh, but streaming, but streaming, streaming is up to I think nine point three billion dollars uh, in royalty payouts. But uh, there are thirty five million songs, actually more than thirty five million songs now uh, on streaming platforms, and there is forty songs, an average of forty song forty thousand songs being added to Spotify every day. So if we just take take the 9.3 and divide it by the 35 million, uh, the number is like $265.71. All things being equal, meaning your your music is streamed just as much as like Bruno Mars and Justin Timberlake and that, um, then then your song is worth a total of $265 and a little bit of change. Yeah. So if you have a 10 song record, you know, and you have all this money in streaming because streaming is doing so well, your album is worth you know two uh, grand. Yeah, two hundred, yeah. you know, twenty six hundred bucks. So this is yeah. your mortgage payment, maybe. Yeah. And so, and so, <laughs> when you, it's just because you know, the, the music industry is just there, there's, it, when you're focused on albums, it's hard to make money. Yeah. But when you look at the TV world, you know, the TV world's growing. Uh, the film world, obviously, we all know is growing. The 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 um, video game world just this last year uh, generated more revenue than film and TV just in the UK alone, and it's getting close to that here in America. So all these outlets need music it, there's actually never been a better time to be a musician uh, if you and, understand the business of if it. you understand the business yes. of it yeah. and uh and really unless you're uh, uh an individual an artist who's touring you know and and, and you've you've got a, a large fan base it's very difficult to make any money in music and that's why the licensing world is growing now all the people in licensing who are your end users they're constantly looking for more material but they're looking for more material from individuals who understand the business that they're in and there's a great phrase that's you know know the game that you're in you know a lot of musicians just don't know how to play the the game of licensing because they still approach it like the music industry they still approach it as a two step process I'm going to finish my record I'm going to burn it and I'm going to hand it to a supervisor they're not including any of the, any of the metadata they're not including any of the various what Nexus. I call valuable content which is the the stems the the 15 30 and 60 second mixes mm-hmm. the alternate mixes 
the the other options that give the uh, the end users options to use their music in other forms. You know, a uh, great example of this is I have a track that I wrote with an artist. Uh, it's been on The Voice a total of uh, 14 times, and only six of those placements in the last two years were the full version. Uh, the other eight versions, eight placements were all another version. What does that tell you? Uh, yeah. So it, it tells you that there's it's 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 a necessity to to deliver your um, valuable your valuable assets. content and mm-hmm. and taking this another step further. I know stems. Uh, sometimes people don't really understand the value of stems, but you also got to keep in mind that in music we're mixing in stereo, right? We mix music in stereo, but what are most TV shows and films mixed in? Mono. Five point one. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you're thinking mm-hmm. AM radio. <laughs> I'm thinking uh, voice. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so most films are in 5.1, 7.1, and the 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 final step in the process of mixing those films is, is a re-recording mixer. That's his job. And oftentimes a re-recording mixer doesn't want to deal with a stereo sound. They mm-hmm. want stems. They want to maybe place the drums over here and maybe put the guitars here and if maybe put the vocals over here and maybe kind of put the keyboards here so that's more of a surround experience for you. That's the value of adding in those other versions when you're delivering your music, when you're playing the game. So if you're writing great music and you understand this game and are prepared to deliver these assets, the metadata is there, you can really crush. And then you're and you're basically You've got a book right there that you've written for. You've got a book right there. I don't have a copy of that. That's yours. (laughs) Well, I mean, crushing, I'm not sure if you can really guarantee crushing. You're just ahead of the the wave. No, I think the people that are doing it and and are doing well at it It, are doing the same thing, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the people who are, who are, who are, my whole um, focus when it comes to licensing is, is consistency. Mm -hmm. You know, a a lot of times people will ask like, well, how much can you make with a song? Well, it's not about how much you can make with a song. You can make 80 grand with a song. You could also make $15. It's not about that. (laughs) It's, it's about the consistency. It's about getting, you know, if you can get, you know, say two dozen, uh, placements in this next quarter that are going to pay you $500 in a royalty, that's nice. But then if you can get 10 that are going to pay you $1,500 in a royalty, that's great. And if you can get five, they're going to pay you three to $5,000 in a royalty. That's awesome. And if you can get another like 30 or 40 that are each going to pay you, you know, 25, you know, 40, you know, 30, $40, that's also great. That's consistency because then that's how you get your quarterly statements that are, you know, 25, $30,000. It's not about one placement that made $30,000. It's, was the, it's about multiple what, placements. What was the, the, um, least amount of time piece that you made that paid out the most sure i i did a commercial that took me about two hours paid sixty thousand dollars i love it that's fantastic you know that's two years of teaching as a teacher yeah well that's most people's salaries right there he made in two hours yeah, I actually, I, 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 I did it because I was so bored. I was hanging out in a studio. Because <laughs> he was the, uh, bored. <laughs> I love it. I love the story. It, it's a funny story. But yeah, the way that that one worked is I was hanging out in a studio. I was sitting on the couch in the back, just, just you know, waiting. And, um, and I had my laptop and I was just, you know, screwing around, you know, moving some loops around. And, and uh, I for, put this thing together. And it took about like maybe 45 minutes. Uh, when I got home, I spent about another 45 minutes just layering down some guitars uh, and then I, I probably spent, you know, a half hour, 45 minutes mixing it. Mm-hmm. So I probably had like two hours into it. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. When you when you come up with this stuff, because I got to wonder, you know, what where you're coming up with a trailer. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's a lot more involved. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. What do you, where where are you mentally? What are you hearing in your head when you start putting them? Are you seeing the images of the, <laughs> of the movie or does the voiceover play a part? You know, are you hearing... In a world, so, like, you know. Um, no, uh, I, you know, the music is usually done before the trailer is even put together. Mm-hmm. Okay, because uh, the way that trailers are done, in fact, trailers are often done before the film is even uh, ready to go. In right. fact, trailers are often done before the the composer has even been chosen for the film. You know, a lot of times you you go to the theater and you're like, "Coming in the summer of 2020." Mm-hmm. You know, we're in the summer of 2019 right now, right? Yeah. And you're like, "Oh my god!" Well, they probably just wrapped up production, you know, and and the trailer company they're they're using some footage that they were given, and then they're creating a you know a, a trailer out of it, and um, you know the editors are probably still working. Working on the movie, and the composer is not going to be chosen until you know October or November for the film. So, so they're pulling from previously written tracks uh, and trailers. Uh, as far as the trailer format, writing in trailer format is um, trailers are written in like three sections. Um, 
So as a whole, they're just written in three sections. Now, when it comes to writing trailers, like anything, it, it changes track to track. I've done I've done some where uh, I've actually gone on on YouTube and I've I've pulled off some trailers and then I load it in the Pro Tools and I strip out all the music and the audio and I just score to what I'm seeing as close as I can. Um, as, as a form of inspiration. You know, maybe mm-hmm. I'll even use the first half of the trailer just to kind of get me going, and then at that point I'll I'll get rid of it, and then I'll kind of keep going. And I, I work on these with my with my writing partner, so we send stuff back and forth. A lot of times that we do trailers is I might do the first portion of it, the first section, send it to him. He'll do the second section over the next, you know, couple of days and send it back to me, and I'm like, oh, this is actually really cool. Then <laughs> I might do something for the third section, send it to him, and he'll kind of finalize it. And So it, it's done in a number of different ways. Um, I work really slow because uh, I'm not a schooled musician. I never went to school for it. Obviously, we talked about that earlier. Mm-hmm. So especially now when I'm writing, like, orchestral pieces, I have an or- orchestra template that I have. Excuse me. And a lot of it is just, it's laid out in a way to where, like, I, you know, the flutes are laid out on my keyboard so that, like, if, if it's out of the flute range, if I hit the note, it's not going to do anything. Mm-hmm. So I'll just sit there and I'll kind of keep, you know, selecting a different instrument and creating a part that I think sounds cool and, it take it might take me three or four days to do a minute's worth of music. Interesting. So you have a template set up. So if you want a score for the flute and you and you're hitting this note, oh, that that's out of the range. Yeah, the so you got to come yeah, down yeah, to yeah. the octave yeah. below. Yeah, because because when it comes to um, um, actually now we have an orchestra that actually play that stuff when it comes to recording it for real. So oh, like yeah, over so, in Europe or Prague or something. Uh, like yeah, Greece and um, Greece. Yeah, and so it's a lot cheaper than America, <laughs> and they do a great job. And um, and so yeah yeah so if I'm like working on a on a violin part you know the violin has a range and so you know I can only go so go so to a, to a point um, so that, yeah it'll take a while to do that and uh, but it's a, it's a lot of fun it's creatively rewarding and and, and the part of what we do is because I'm, I'm a rock guitar player by nature my, my writing partner is really a trained composer he went to college and you know learned how to do all these incredible um, w- you know we're a great marriage of, of really classical orchestration with rock elements you know so all of the sonic trimmer stuff generally has like a lot of rock element to a lot of the the formation of a rock band bass gu- you know, bass guitar drums or you know um, you know, electric guitar and then the orchestra and the strings and, and the wind instruments and all that stuff uh, and, and so we, we kind of have a, a, a unique sound, you know, and, and that kind of creates its own little thing. That's a great partnership. I mean, we yeah. every one of these episodes, we speak to the power of relationships. So, yeah. I mean, you guys came into each other's lives for a reason, and you're doing, like, great work together. I mean, you got this whole cottage cash cow industry <laughs> happening. Yeah. Um, what do you uh, – do you want to talk a little bit about your educational program that you that – you, uh, We can. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I want to sure. want to move some units for you. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, you know, when I moved back here um, in 2000 and and really, I think it was in 2012, I spoke at some conference, some music event, and I I don't remember what it was called, Um, but at that point, word got out that here was this guy in Nashville who was doing well with sync licensing, and and for a number of years, I just, you know, was getting called by a lot of publishers and and artists, and, you know, people would get my number and be like, hey, can we get coffee and can I pick your brain? Mm-hmm. They're picking Mike's brain. You never yes. get that, that question. <laughs> I get that question every day. I know. I know. We've, we've talked about that, Rich. Yes. <laughs> Pick Rich's brain. And um, and I did that, you know, for quite a while. And, you know, I'm, I'm a talker too. So if, if the one hour, you know, uh, coffee turns into five hours. Yes. And to be honest with you, it actually started impacting uh, just – Life. Life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I'd get up and I'd have something that I had to do and have to turn in by five, you know, or f- seven o'clock our time, it's five o'clock their time. And, uh, you know, and then I'm, I'm having a great conversation talking with someone and I, I get to my studio at one o'clock and I'm like, shit, I got to blow through this stuff quickly. And yeah. now I've lost basically half the day talking to someone for a $3 chai tea. Yeah. Right? And usually you end up buying it because they're a, a yeah, college right? student. Isn't that and, funny how that works? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, but that's good on you. Yeah. 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 And I, I like sharing it because, you know, I mean, the, the, the reality is, you know, um, yeah, I've, I've always been a musician who's just been pursuing playing and touring. And, and you know, I love playing in bands. I love playing with humans. And I love playing live. That's just the stuff that I love more than anything. And so I totally understand the struggle. And I understand, uh, you know, I have a passion for for musicians actually having success. And um, so, yeah, so I, I always spend a lot more time than necessary talking about it. <laughs> but I realized I was just saying the same thing over and over and over and over and over. So in the summer of 2017, I, I wrote a little book, uh, which basically outlined the four steps, 
You know, it's very simple. This is, it's the same conversation I've literally had for 10 years, okay? <laughs> and um, and then uh, a couple months after I did that, I was doing a session uh, for a uh, producer friend of mine and he brought this artist over and we were taking a break and the artist, uh, we just we started talking. I told him, I said, yeah, I just had my 2000th placement. He goes, have you ever thought about writing a book? And I said, that's funny you say that. I just wrote a little book and I send it out to people whenever they ask uh, about licensing. It saves me you know, from having to meet with them and say the same thing over and over. <laughs> and then he said, have you ever thought about doing a course? And I said, oh, yeah, that'll never happen. I will never do that. And uh, the reason oh, why is- Teaching it live, you mean? Uh, or an online course. Because like I was just, I was, ex you know, my experience with that was I was used to, see, you know, you see these people on Facebook who are holding up their phone going like, hey, here's my Lamborghini and here's mm -hmm. my other Lamborghini. And right. I just thought those guys were douchebags. So, um, yeah, but the, the, so you, I, you know, we all know what they're selling. Yes. You know? yeah. yeah. So I, I didn't want to have anything to do with that. And uh, it took him about three months. He convinced me to, to, to put together uh, this course. And, and, um, and I did. And, uh, and I released it in 2018. And, uh, and it's been the most um fulfilling thing that I've ever done in my career. Really? Yeah, and and um to articulate why it's it's because uh same reason why I love playing guitar live and I wish I could, you know, do that more. Uh it's because of the connection. You know, I've spent so much of my life in a studio and kind of like you were saying earlier, you just kind of like being the madman in, in the production realm. But that's very solitary. You know, and even if you're in the studio with someone else, you're you're hanging with one or two people. But but when you play live, you're making a connection with all these people, right? And with the course, the course has allowed me to make a connection with all these people who I would have never had any contact with. I mean, literally hundreds and, and, and even even thousands with the amount of people that, that get my, um, you know, read the blogs and all the other videos that I put out. And, uh, and, and even those who don't take the course just to see the difference that it's making in their lives. Like they're starting to get placements now with their songs because they learned how to, how, to, how to play the game in the TV industry. And uh, and that to me is the most fulfilling thing because it's it's transforming lives of people who I've really just never met, but they're accomplishing the goals that they set out that they've been pursuing for a long time, and now they finally have an outlet for their songs. You know, a lot of them have just been depressed about the music industry and you know not even wanting to make records anymore, but now they realize oh they can go back into their studio and monetize their songs and provide for their family, and that to me has been the most uh, fulfilling aspect of it. That's hmm. amazing, and 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 it's doing well. It's like yeah. so selling like hotcakes. People are getting like, yeah, you're changing lives with that yeah. thing, it's and awesome. you're you're so knowledgeable about it. You're Michael's going to help me, so because I have drumming in the modern yeah drumming in the modern world dot com, yep. and we're going to give it a facelift. Yep. We're going to add some new material, and we're going to call it Crash Course for Drumming Success. Heck yeah, and we're so excited about that. Yeah, yeah. well, the, the cool thing with that is. And the reason why I become passionate just about the online, I, I literally went from a, a total 180 about the online world uh, because because uh, once I got into it, I realized you have the power with your drum program, again, to change lives. Yes. You know, how many, how many, I don't want to say kids, but how many younger, you know, maybe high school age kids who want to pursue drums, uh, you know, for a career and drumming for a career, they can, they can go through your program and they can get direction that they could never get from uh, like the local drum teacher in their small town mm -hmm. who never really did anything outside of that small town, right? right? And, and I think that's the power uh, of, of having online programs, uh, that especially from professionals who not only worked in the industry, but who continue to work in the industry and, and, and who are still engaged with the industry and who understand the changes and, and what it really takes to make something happen. Um, yeah, I, I, I've become a big believer in that. I, I really think that the online education world is going to be um, the, huge. The, the way of the future considering, you know, what is college? Like $40,000 a year? It's, yeah. it's insane. My uh, friend of mine, Brad Lee. I'm the cheap, yeah. Yeah. You know, Brad. Uh, you know what? When I was at the, I just got back from the National Speakers Association in Denver for four days and there was about 10 sp high-level speakers that are using... Uh, Lightspeed? Brad, yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. a virtual training platform. He's gonna yeah. he's creating a college. Yeah, I mean, that's what yeah. really what he's doing. Basically, he's yeah he's in Vegas, and it's mm -hmm. like it's high production value. You go to his place and you use his facilities. It's all state oh, of the art. Awesome. You know, all virtual training, so you can yeah. literally you know take the courses. I guess you answer the questions yeah. right there while you're taking the course on the screen. And right. I haven't seen it in action, but a lot of Tony Robbins uses it. Um, Damon John. Damon oh, Johns cool. yeah, is yeah, using yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's incredible because you know even now you know I mean how many of us have spent 
many 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 hours on youtube yeah watching lessons mm-hmm. you know and and uh look and at just, mike mike's lessons.com my yeah. gosh he did good well he was uh he was first on scene <clears throat> you know but there's yeah there's room for all of us to have this this online training it's it's where it's going you know uh well, yeah. i you know i think probably all the kids that uh that come to my next drummer's weekend which is october 19 and 20 in nashville i'll probably throw them a lifelong membership to a uh, crash course for drumming yeah. success so they'll have access to five and a half hours worth of material yeah. mm-hmm. and um you know, they could reach out to me with questions at any time, and then we're going to create this. Um, Michael told me I should have this private online community, so we set up Drumming in the Modern World, the Facebook page. We're going to make a, at a, at a private page for yeah. all the people that buy the product, yeah. and then they can all interact with each other and ask yeah. me questions whenever yeah. they want. Yeah. Yeah. So it's Absolutely. like it's yeah, very, you're, very you're smart. You're creating a great community, uh, you know, of people who all understand what, you, what you're showing, and, you know, that's, um, I, I mean, there's so much power in that. Uh, you know, I think as someone who just despised uh, college mm-hmm. <laughs> and and didn't even attend really, um, I, I think back to man, if, if this stuff was available back then, back in the you know the mid nineties, uh, it, it would have been a, an astronomically different career path. Uh, I think, at least for me, college was very you know? damaging for me. Yeah, why? How so? Because it was you know it was pounded in our heads back then that if you didn't go to college and you know get a degree that you were going to be a failure for the rest yeah, of yeah oh life. absolutely oh okay. my, yeah. well, my you know god bless them my parents were like look you're going to yeah. college you know my, my, my parents put me through college but yeah. you know in year two it just wasn't for me mm-hmm. so i stopped western connecticut state university oh, yeah, west yeah, con yeah. yeah and um i you know for for years i carried that with me yeah. just you know I, I wasn't good enough thank yeah. thank god you know. the colleges i went to were incredible Incredibly good training programs. Yeah, for you, were so you, you were able to choose your college, and you were able to choose your what you your wanted program. to do. Yeah. yeah, we were told. You, you were just said yeah. you're going here. My my yeah, brother, yeah. his one of his regrets, and he and I talked about it. He's a, he's an amazing musician. He says looking back, because he went he went to college for business, yeah. and then went on to law school in Lansing, Michigan, and now he's an attorney and he does very well. But he plays in the, he plays in a Journey tribute band. He uh-huh. plays in a Bob Seger tribute band. And he's constantly playing on the weekends and stuff. So he um, he says, you know, I really wish that I just went to college uh, for music. Yeah, and he says I would have aced everything. Yep, and then that would have gotten me like a uh, a a, a um, uh, you know the money for sure. uh, uh, law school. Yeah, you know, oh, a, interesting. A grant yeah. or something. Doesn't like that. Your scholarship? Brother, doesn't he play in uh, a Billy Joel co- tribute band? Journey. Oh, Journey. Because, you yeah. know, today is Liberty DeVito's birthday. The really? longtime drummer for Billy Joel. Yeah. 30 years. Hey, that's a good run. Yeah, you know? no so, kidding, right? So how do I do the licensing thing for voiceover? Do I just, you know... Is there such a thing? I, I don't know. Is there? You Let's could create say, it. Yeah. So I'll just say various phrases and then license them out. Make a CD. I mean, I mean, why don't you be the first guy to do this? I'm sure people have thought about this, but what would I say? You know, it'd be interesting. Is is if there if there are common phrases, you could probably in the world a game of cat and mouse. Yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> no, but he does he does a custom greeting like press one to talk to, or just what if I read Facebook posts from people. Mean huh? tweets. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mean tweets. Have you guys seen that thing on on YouTube where it's like people do this? <laughs> what? Have you seen that? What? No, it's this it's insane hilarious. thing. I don't know what they call it, but it's like it's like a um, like. They'll, they'll, oh no, that's that's called um, AMSR. Is, is that, that what that it's is? called? Yeah, my kids are into it. Really? It's like listening. To, you know, the, the, my wife has got. I think it's. it's I think it's called misophonia. It is the weirdest thing. And it's like you know, chewing something. Yeah. And you're listening to it with headphones on. Yeah. The people come right? up with the weirdest yeah. things, like the weirdest like video Welcome fetishes. To the yeah. Well, you remember yeah. you were like like these people are making millions of dollars a year opening presents or toys. children's yeah. toys. Yeah. Now, guys, I think I missed my calling because I can you imagine with my energy I go just <laughs> Look at this, guys! <laughs> this is amazing. Like I could, I could have done it, but I didn't because maybe I was busy playing drums the, for someone knew? and bringing their songs to it was life. By, but those things were stumbled upon by accident. Yeah. Well, this is what the great thing about this is what I'm jealous about music licensing is is that I spent all these tens of thousands of hours and all these decades of my life to get a skill set together to help someone bring their songs or their music to life. Yeah. Unless I am hired to do that and do it in real time or via the internet, like my time is the money, right? Yeah, you're trading you're trading time, time for, for dollars. So yeah. meanwhile, you create this piece, one piece of music, 
in two hours and it can literally be earning you money for the rest of your life. Yeah. That's yeah, incredible. Yeah. For, for, for you got to adapt ride. though. I mean, yeah. you got to, you know, you. Gotta, I mean, as a producer, I could tell you right now that the music that was put out 10 years ago is already stale. You're, you you know? are 100% correct. And that's that's why that's why there's an abundance of opportunity in this industry because they're always looking for new music. Yeah. A new and new stylings and, and yeah. yeah, yeah, new new sounds, everything. The I next mean, <laughs> Yeah. Sub bass drop 43. <laughs> <laughs> you got to be able to pick pick, pick them and audition them. And that's that's the Michael Bay movie with the transformer slow motion jumping yeah, over big their bridge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what's amazing is so many so many trailers now are actually just sound design. They're not even music. Right? There's no music. It's yeah. just sound effects. Well, yeah. the thing for radio went through that. If you looked at imaging work parts for radio back in the 70s and 80s, it was all just like, you know, yeah. and then it, then it became, <laughs> bing. Yeah. And it's just little three second yeah. things that guys would. Little Seinfeldisms. It, but that's what the, they would put them together. Yeah. And I could play you stuff that will blow your flipping mind. That, you know, a little uh, six-second piece, a stinger, that the guy putting it together in the radio studio probably used 40 tracks on. But, you know, oh, yeah. Because yeah. when we were doing, like, like for example, like 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 sub-bass drops and stuff like that, when we were doing our stuff, one of the nice things about playing guitar is a lot of them have whammy bars, you know? Mm. So you can, yeah. right? So you can, you can layer some really cool distorted thing underneath some synth thing and a bunch of other, you know, sounds and then slow them down and pitch shift them. And then you have this very unique... Yeah. Sub bass drop that sounds like it was done with a synth, but it's actually done with you know, you know, fifteen or twenty hey. different tracks yeah. mm -hmm. of stuff. Yep. Hey, but look at one of my favorite sitcoms, The King of Queens. It's like cash register drawers closing and opening, all percussion and maybe some slap bass, uh -huh. and that's all the transition music. And a lot of horror films. I mean, everyone knows I'm a huge horror buff. It's all tension oh. beds oh, and sound design. Yeah. That's horror. It. You're yeah. saying horror. Horror. Okay. horror. I thought you said something else. Horror. Oh, come on. You said that in the two episodes ago. But like, shh. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 definitely in a... Sound effects. I love it. That's another genre that could be updated. Like, someone's got to get a new freaking Mack truck, like, horn-blowing Doppler <laughs> effect. It's used in have, have you ever constantly. just Explosions. Have you ever just sat and when you're watching a sitcom, just listen to... I hear sound effects I use. Do you ever just listen to the audience, the laugh tracks? They're awful. They're atrocious. That's very that's very Brady Bunch. Yeah, that's uh, the Price is Right loser sound. Oh, that, was, that was a trumpet. That I was should a have trumpet. recognized yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, uh, but you know, the, the, the sound effects of the crowds, you like what you're talking about, the canned laughter, yeah. awful. I know. They're awful. <laughs> atrocious. They're yeah. awful. You know, the hard thing is, is, is this, especially after working, you know, like like um, focusing in on, on listening to the audio mm -hmm. on, on TV shows as opposed to uh, the actual TV show itself, um, I find myself just listening to when I'm watching a sitcom, I, I get so distracted by the laugh track. Yeah. Like, oh, God, this is so it bad. It takes are, away Are from they us. all so pretty bad. stock or do they... Where, where do they record them? Do they get a bunch of people in the room at the yeah. same time? And I, I, I've got, I've got, you know, la crowd laughter one, and it's like ha 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 ha, you know, and a bunch of people in the room, in the room just yeah. laughing. It's great. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's but the other thing that drives me insane about that is the guy who's running it is just like every second yeah. hitting a different one. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like it's just it's a thirty sec thirty minutes of laugh tracks. Wait yeah. a minute, do they do that in real time as they're filming? No. Okay, no, they that's all post. Yeah. But he, it, I like how you answered me. No, you're like, no, you dumbass. <laughs> no. no, because what audience is going to laugh at some of those bad jokes? <laughs> well, you know what? I mean, they're crafting some of the, you know, if the joke isn't landing with yeah. the audience, they rewrite it on the yeah. spot or they say, try saying it like well, this. Well, I think a lot yeah. of times they also want the audience to be quiet, you know, so they can get mm -hmm. the audio all, all right Crystal for, clear. The, for, the, uh, for the actors. Yeah. The other thing I pick up in uh, shows and movies are... Um, Door close sound effects. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm going, I have that sound effect. Well, then you're yeah. getting... Or the door opening sound yeah. You're getting Green? into Foley, which yeah. is a... Oh, that's really, a whole other world. It's yeah. a beautiful yeah. part of the music. It's interesting. It's the movie really making creative. Process. It yeah. really is. I mean, yeah. if you're ta you're talking to a guy that, that you know, I'm a trained percussionist, so we're, we're talking about walk through the sand, yeah. drop this mm -hmm. glass, yeah. hit this piece of meat. Yeah, you, you yeah. break a leg and it's like... 
break it's a broccoli. tree branch. Yeah, it's yeah. broccoli. Celery. Yeah. Celery. Yeah. celery. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's yeah. some really, that's a craft. Oh, it's it's totally an is. art, and I hope it doesn't go away. Matter of fact, like two years ago, the Nashville Film Festival, there was a documentary on Foley, and they're yeah. like, this is a dying art because everyone has stock sounds stock, yeah. now. Yeah. And so, like, everybody's career path is being impacted in some way, it and you is. just have to figure out. Technology. You remember when the Lynn drum machine came out? We oh, and, yeah. and, and it was like Tina Turner's What's Love Got to Do with It. <laughs> We were like, this this is over. Yeah, yeah we're and, done. Here we are. We're incorporating it. Triggers, yeah. Yeah. tracking, Ableton. The 808 kit. Yeah. But the funny thing is, I have a funny story, if you want to wrap it up after this. Uh, are you, is this a subtle hint? It's uh, my brother calls me up. I'm in my radio production studio in Vegas. And he knows I, you know, I made different sound effect um, scenarios mostly that were violent and traumatic and stuff like that. So if, you know, you hear a gunshot and, you know, boom, and then, you know, the, boom, you know, that, uh -huh. that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And it sounded like someone really got shot and they, you know, their brains got blasted against That's the wall. Pleasant. You know, so my brother, he, he, I, I played this sound effect I had put together of, you hear like the tires screeching coming in like, and all of a sudden, you know, the impact and then the horn blast. Uh -huh. So he's like, you need to call a friend of mine and play that and like leave him a message, pretend you're a client and then get distracted by something and then just, you know, have that play and then just hang up. Dang. Did you do it? Yeah. <laughs> Did it you believe it? Awesome. Because oh. I met the guy. He actually brought the guy out to Vegas and it was literally like, hey, hey, uh, Joe, I just wanted to tell you um, I'm going to be by your office. And then I started playing the sound effect. I'm like, hold on a minute. Oh my god! Oh my god! And then you know, just I just recorded it and played it as is off the multi tracker. Unbelievable! And then just click, click off we went. And this guy, like a month later, comes to Vegas. He goes, my brother introduces me. He's like, hey, this is the guy. <laughs> and he goes, come here. <laughs> He's like, you son of a. <laughs> You must I was calling hospitals that day. Oh, that's wow. Amazing. That's amazing. Good job, The power Jim. of sound that effects, man. Good job, Jim. <laughs> so, hey, so, hey, Michael, what, um, you know, what's, what, any parting thoughts? You know, what are you working on? What do you want to do in the next couple of years? How can people find you? <laughs> what do I want to do in the next couple of years? Yeah, what do you want to do you with your life? To that. You know? What inspire? What happens after we die? Uh, well, yeah. If you want to contact me, if you want to learn the the licensing uh, side of things, uh, you can you can download uh, the book that I have. I'll show it to you quick. Master Music yeah. License. You can actually, yeah, you can go to you can get it for free at mastermusiclicensing.com or you can go to Amazon and you can pay seven bucks. Nice. So it's up to nice. you. How, I remember when you were writing you it. That was, was cool. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's 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 been awesome. It's it's a great outline of of the of the process, and it's a great introduction to uh, you know the, the difference the difference between the music industry path and the and the licensing path. I like that. Yeah, I remember you inspire me. You're like, hey, I'm gonna put together a little ebook, and I was like, and you know, give it away, and and I was like, wow, I'll do this. So I wrote five keys to drumming success. Yeah. So if you go to my Instagram page. You know, uh, which is just at Rich Redmond. You know, you have all those options yeah. down below. You can just hit on free ebook, and boom, you you've got yeah. five keys to drumming success. There you go, free. Yeah. You can't argue with free. That's right. <laughs> right? Who argues with free? I mean, you or gave maybe, me this for free. That's would right. You, so I've been would it be better it. to say, hey, for only a dollar? For only ninety nine right. cents. Does that does that say does that have a little bit more like because people say well no one's giving anything away. Well, I mean, I mean, ultimately, you, when you just know, pay the shipping, you give well, away you give away an ebook and you start a relationship with somebody and then you you're able to yeah. communicate continuously. Yeah, yeah, and and you don't have to go and and you know spend four hours having coffee for three dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather give it to you for free. But if you know you have what? Any questions beyond that? All those know. people are going to remember you and be like, you know, I sat down with them. What a great guy. Well, I hope so. You know, that's hey, the equity. That's what you and I did that's years the, ago. I know. It was the legacy. That's how now Jim, look at us. That's how Jim and I met because I wanted to be a voiceover artist and uh, add to my bag of tricks. And yeah. we're all friends all those years yeah. later. And it's I was funny like, how I, that works. I don't know what you're talking about when it comes to voiceover, man. <laughs> I said, why do you want to get in the voiceover? You're, you're the drummer for Jason Aldean. That's cool. <laughs> Gotta have extra skills, in a booth. Well, yeah, you know, I, I totally understand that because, like, you know, just because you did one thing doesn't mean that that's where you want to stay. You know, I didn't know like that you, about you, Rich. you accomplished it, and it's yeah. like, okay, cool, I got that. Now there's something else. The only thing I, I knew about Rich at the time was when I saw him on the Hicktown video, and I was like, oh, I could totally play this song. <laughs> and then I met him, and I saw him play it. I'm like, 
No, I can't play it like that. Ah, oh, you're a good drummer. You just have, uh, you know, I'm you rusty. Got, you got rusty. I'm majorly rusty. Yeah. I gotta shake it off. The the white bread days are long gone. You need crash course for drumming success. I, <laughs> I need to have to play an effective double stroke is what I need to do. I love it. I I'm still working on my paradiddles. You're the, you're the man. Yeah, me too. Thank you so After much for joining years. us and uh, you know, shedding some light on the master music yeah, licensing yeah. game. And yeah. uh, I hope people reach out to you. Guys, thanks so much for tuning in. This has been the Rich Redmond Show. Please comment, like, share, and we'll subscribe. see you next time. Yeah, subscribe, and we'll see you next time. This has been the Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.